I spend a lot of time uh, as part of my research, talking and interviewing other CEOs leading other major companies through digital transformations in different sectors and industries. And I think a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about resonates very strongly with what they would say if they were with you today. Thank you ever so much for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to this session. As you've just heard, I, I led Pearson through what was a very, very challenging digital transformation. Uh, 10 years ago, Pearson was the world's leading book publisher. It was still a major sort of analog print-based company with some interesting digital startups, but still primarily an analog business. And the digital transformation we went through was as challenging as anything you've seen in music or newspapers or publishing or the retail sector or elsewhere. And we and I made plenty of mistakes and got plenty of things wrong along the way. And we saw the pressure and the strain of the changes that we had to make in terms of share price performance and profit warnings and all of that. But I'm pleased to say that 10 years on, Pearson is clearly on the rise again. We've come through it exceptionally strongly and it is now the world's leading digital learning company. Um, so the lessons I'm going to share with you this afternoon are based on my own personal experiences. But as you heard from the, the life I live now, I spend a lot of time uh, as part of my research, talking and interviewing other CEOs, leading other major companies through digital transformations in different sectors and industries. And I think a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about resonates very strongly with what they would say if they were with you today. Um, now, the changes that we made required Pearson to focus. Uh, so we couldn't be successful across digital transformation in trade publishing, newspapers, and education. So we sold iconic brands like the Financial Times, uh, Penguin, The Economist. Um, so we could focus everything on being the world's di leading digital learning company. And that focus was vital to us making a success of it. The proceeds that we raised in excess of three billion dollars, we reduced we we reduced debt, so the company had virtually no debt at all as it was working through this major transformation that was vital to giving our shareholders the confidence that we had the financial strength to see ourselves through some very challenging times, and we made huge investments in our digital infrastructure, taking what was a complex, fragmented, and inefficient infrastructure, which many. Companies like Pearson that have been in business for a long time would have, we had 56 different ERP systems, 65 HR systems, uh, 95 data centers around the world, 3,000 different websites, 200 different ways of doing e-commerce, 200 different ways of creating content and the like. And we transformed that into being a truly mobile and digital first learning company. And we shifted from essentially product and business models that were based primarily on analog and print and were around ownership to ones that were digital and mobile first and very much about access and software as a service type ideas. And as a result, by the time I left the company, something like 70 to 75 percent of our revenues were now digital based compared with only 25 percent a decade um, earlier. But what's interesting about that is I would say for all those things I've just rattled off, by far the big, biggest digital challenge, a biggest single challenge we faced was a nagging doubt at the back of my mind, which is, are we investing all this time and effort in a digital infrastructure, but are we going to be left with an analog company and organization and culture? And I know from talking to other CEOs, it's what they worry about. Often people talk about, we talk about being bruised black and blue from head to toe with the pressure and trying to bring about the cultural change. And I think there's a good reason for that. If you, um, if you read the book called well, Thank You For Being Late by Tom Friedman, he talks about, he actually quotes an executive from IBM who describes that whilst digital change is exponential and the pace at which digital is getting ever quicker and accelerating, Humans change in a much more linear way. And it's this gap between the exponential digital change and human change happening in a much more linear way that puts all the pressure and strain on organizations, I think, going through this digital transformation. And how you close that gap is crucial. And so from the seven lessons I normally talk about, I've honed it down to 
to five lessons that are really all about these cultural and organizational change. I'm going to run through them very quickly now, and then I'm going to share some thoughts as what this means specifically for people who are working as sort of chief people officers, chief HR officers, or working in the in the HR organization more generally. So my first lesson from the front line of digital digital disruption and transformation is the importance of a, dig, of a disruptive mindset. F. Scott Fitzgerald uh, once defined first-rate intelligence as the ability to believe two mutually contradictory things at the same time and not go mad. And that's what you need at times of great digital change. When the big, our biggest and most successful analog business in Pearson first started to show the strains of digital disruption, every fiber of the corporate being wanted to tell me that the problem was cyclical, not structural. Because if it was a cyclical problem, well, college enrollments are down this year, there's been a change in federal policy, some new regulations come in, it's an off year in the addition cycle. Whatever the reason doesn't require you to ask more fundamental questions about how you run and operate the business. So this ability to see how the business is today and run it as it is today, but understand that everything that you hold dear about this business may no longer be true, that's the that's the disruptive mindset. But what makes it more complicated is just because disruption is coming at you and all sorts of things can be disruptive, not everything will be. And so you have to see disruption everywhere. And sometimes the right thing to do is to act immediately. Sometimes the, time, the, the right thing to do is to wait and see. And you will only know in retrospect which was the right course. But this constantly scanning the horizon, constantly thinking and thinking about how could the world be different from everything the way it's always been is fundamentally important. The second lesson is this idea of what I would describe as the cross test. So about 12 years ago now, I was diagnosed with uh, throat cancer and I went through an extensive period of treatment. And to, to help me on the spiritual side, I befriended a Benedictine priest who introduced me to this, this phrase, the cross tests. And what it essentially means is at times of personal crisis, we strip away all the superfluous layers that we build up around ourselves and we reveal who we fundamentally are at our core. And I believe that, it, that for companies going through corporate crises, which digital disruptions often are, the same things applies that it reveals who we really are and what our identity and purpose is. And why Pearson got through the digital transformation, we understood that from it, fundamentally we weren't about publishing, you know, print textbooks or publishing print exams. We were about the world's very best pedagogy, the art and science of learning. We were about helping people to understand great ideas, working with the world's very best authors and educators. If you look at what got the music industry through, what got trade publishing or newspapers, it's the importance of ideas and creating great music. There's neither fundamentally analog or digital. So really understanding what your identity is and understanding how that translates to the new world is vital but also a sense of purpose. Uh, we got through some very, very tough times in Pearson because everybody in the organization bought into this idea that the digital transformation of the company meant that we could empower millions of people around the world to progress in their lives through learning. We could democratize and personalize and make education, high quality education, much more accessible to far more people than ever before. And so at times when the cross tests the importance of identity and purpose is fundamentally important. The third lesson I think I would, I would focus on it is this idea of, of learn, don't guess. For a lot of analog companies, um, you can take your time to bring the new product to market. Certainly in our, in our business, you know, there'd be a new edition every three years and we would hone that new edition to within an inch of its life and get every last detail of it right before we published to market. Digital doesn't work like that. It's a case of iterating, it's modifying. Um, Mark Thompson of the New York Times talks about the fact that they probably tell, tell 14, 15 times of iterating the digital product for the New York Times before they, they got it right. So this idea of learn, don't guess is very important. 
But it's not to be confused with something that used to drive me mad at times. There was a time at Pearson when everybody was quoting um, Mark Zuckerberg, um, you know, move fast and break things. Um, most businesses can't afford to break things. Our customers rely on us too much. They're too dependent on the quality and integrity of what we do. It's too important to their daily lives. So it's not sort of recklessly, oh, let's just change lots of things and see what's happened. But it is about learning, not guessing. Um, and that's very important. So also things like, I would argue, um, sometimes doing is the best form of thinking. Um, when we're used to all our strategic plans and nothing gets done until it's been through this lengthy process. So iterating, trying, learning, um, not trying to make too many big, big bets at once, but lots of little bets, seeing what's working and iterating as you go and really creating a learning culture in the company where you learn from each other. And when something goes wrong, it's not who the fell's fault is it, it's how interesting, how fascinating, what can we learn from that? And how can we then make something better as a result? The fourth lesson is one that my the very last email I wrote to, to Pearson staff to the 25,000 people in the company after my 25 years with the company when I left was I quoted Bob Dylan. I said, um, Pearson had been busy, been born for 175 years and long may that be continued because if you're not busy being born, you're busy dying. And so getting this understanding that change is not something that happens episodically, but it's continuous and ongoing is I think, and something to be embraced, not to be frightened of, is really, really important. In the early days of the digital transformation of Pearson, I would set my watch by the fact that 15, 20 minutes into any town hall, somebody would put their hands up and say, are we finished changing yet, John? Is the transformation done? And so you have to find ways to make the oh, people understand that change is a core competence, that change is something that happens all the time, but it's something to be welcomed and enjoyed, not something to be endured or suffered from. And this is really important because COs like me, when we're going through big digital transformations, we like to talk in messianic terms about digital disruption and transformation, not realizing that if you're not careful, that just frightens and confuses people. It doesn't help them. So you've got to be really careful not to make change seem that something is large, vague and far away because that is hugely disempowering. What on earth? And most people in your company meant to do with that. But if you can make the change seem small, specific, and near term, then that's something that people can sort of engage with. So they need the light on the hill. Yes, they need to be inspired, but then they need to understand what that translates immediately into them. And it also requires you, I think, to listen. Um, as we went through, I would spend more and more time with small groups of, of colleagues at different levels. I would listen to them, I'd hear with them what we were getting wrong, how in making changes, what inadvertent we had broken. We would reverse things, we would learn from each other, we would share things. Um, I came to fear the meeting after the meeting. So when we as an executive team had made a big change and we'd all agreed it, and then when they went back and talked to their own teams about it, the pushback, the second guessing. And so we went for radical transparency. We had the meetings before the meeting, before a big decision was gonna be made by the executive team. We would ensure that we had, as far as we could, uh, popularized it and shared it. So people had a chance to input ahead of time and we made better decisions as a, as a result. We created this idea as Pearson, as the primary family, that around any leadership or executive team, you're not there as head of product or head of sales or chief technology officer. You're there as a senior leader of the company, first and foremost, to make the best interest for the company, make the decision that's best for the organization. And um, pinching an idea from Jeff Bezos, we talked about this idea of disagree and commit, because you want the disagreements out on the table. You don't want passive resistance. You want people to be able to express what their concerns are, what they're worried about, what their fears are. And then you make the decision and commit, so it's not disagree, but commit, it's and commit, that once the decision is made, 
your job is not to sort of hope that in six months' time you can say, look, I, you know, I prove you prove you made the wrong decision, but you're there to make a success of implementing it. And I would personally try and role play that. I think as leaders, it's really important that we do that. If an issue came up with the team, I would explain what I was worried about. I would listen to them. And if it was one where they clearly, as often did, had much more competence and insight than me, and if it wasn't a completely sort of, you know, bet the farm decision, I'd say, right, get on and do it, and I'm going to completely commit to support you. And if it goes wrong, I will absolutely not say I told you so, but we will all learn and work together. And then my fifth lesson is the importance of sticking with it. Um, the reality is that digital transformations take decades, not years. You know, the Pearson transformation has been at least 10 years in the making. And it fell to me to have to do, to be the, to happen to be the CEO when we went through some of the hardest and most difficult and most challenging times. Um, but sometimes the path chooses you, you don't get to choose the path. And your job is always just to make sure that you do what is in the best long-term interest of the organization and trust that everything will work out in the end and that that's the job that you have to play. And so this idea of, of perseverance and resilience of sticking with it, I think is really important. So those are my five lessons, importance of a disruptive mindset, this idea of the cross test and understanding your identity and purpose, learning, not guessing. Uh, if you're not busy being born, you're busy dying, this adoption and understanding of the importance of change and, 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 and sticking with it and recognizing that these don't operate necessarily in the, the sort of cycles of CEO leadership that we, we'd like them to. So very quickly, what does that mean for people and HR transformation? Well, the first thing to say is digital transformations are really, really hard. They put a lot of pressure on a lot of different functions in the organization. But if I look back, it probably put more pressure on our HR colleagues than anybody else. We, we reduced the cost base by over 25%. We had... So probably something about 7,000 people will leave the company out of a global workforce after 35,000. Huge amount of restructuring. It felt at times that we were perpetually restructuring. Big changes in our ways of working. A lot of hiring of new talent with new skills, new cultures, new values who didn't share a lot of the history and understanding of the company. Upskilling, reskilling existing employers, changing all your systems all at once. God, that's really, really hard. And the truth is you're often doing it under pressure because as much as we should, very few of us fix the digital infrastructure when the sun's shining. So we're having to do it when the markets are turning and when we're under pressure. And that's hugely challenging and that in itself then requires it as look at everything else. You're having to redesign and create new reward and remuneration policies that, that adopt to the new reality. So the Operational stress and strain, I would say, on HR and people functions through this is very, very heavy. And you know what? Most of your colleagues in other functions don't appreciate it probably as much as they should. And HR can become a, a shock absorber for a lot of the stress and strain that's in the, in the organization. But if you do that really well, I think it gives you the license and the opportunity to also as, as people leaders to play a much more strategic influencing and shaping role. What might that mean? Um, how do you find, do you, you know, if you think that these five lessons that I've just mentioned have, have validity, uh, what would that mean in terms of how they get reflected in management development programs so that people do develop, for example, a disruptive mindset? How would that look and how would you encourage people to do that? Um, how does it get designed into appraisals and, and personal growth plans? Um, how do we really create a learning culture that permeates everything that we do? You know, if you look at, for example, the success of Microsoft, many people would say that the biggest single thing Satya Nadella has done has really create a culture of learning within the company. And that's a great opportunity or should be for, for HR and, and, and people organizations organization design and, and support every organization is is in my view on a constantly tracking between you know more hierarchical and more network of formal and informal and um if you're doing the heavy lifting of really trying to you know replace 56 different erp systems and the like the truth is, although no one likes to say it, you're going to have to have a high degree of hierarchy because you won't get it done otherwise. But then if you're going to be in a learning 
not guessing and you're going to be much more innovative around product and business model development, then the networks and particularly the impl- informal networks become much more important as well. I think HR and people can play, people organisation can play a really important strategic role in helping the CEO and colleagues to really think through what that means and really design that into uh, into really transforming the organization. So um, I think the, the whole operational side of it is a hugely important role, but I think I would really encourage HR folk not to then just be the sort of Cinderella in the room who's happy to do all that, but then does also challenge themselves to say, to, to put themselves up and say, well, actually this then gives us the right and the opportunity and the insight and the knowledge to play this much more strategic and influence and shaping role as well. And with that, um, I think that hopefully leaves us with a few minutes for questions, and I hope that was helpful. John, that was amazing. I mean, squeezing in such a massive transformation into eight years, and it's still ongoing, and squeezing into half an hour, obviously, it's an impossible task. So thank you so much for trying. And it was uh, so much wisdom and so much uh, so much content, so much lessons. Uh, I Probably I recommend for everybody to watch and rewatch again, because that is just too much content to absorb in such a short time. You as a CEO, what would you recommend for HR leaders in our audience? What sort of skills, competencies they must have or require in order to support an organization conglomerate of, of such size in a, in a successful digital transformation? I, th- I think the, um, I think forming very good relationships with all the other key partners around the executive t- table or been, real, been a real sort of business partner. I think taking the time to understand the business. So, you know, going out call, going out with sales teams on calls or sitting and listening in to the customer service center, um, you know, getting on top of the finances or the business. So you really actually sort of understand the business and, and, and how it works and operates because I think then you're then able to make a better strategic role. And then the second thing I'd say is I think the... And and I I certainly found this in terms of all the HR people. They're just an amazing source of information because when you're having to do, you know, all the restructuring, all the hard work, when you're putting all those new teams in place, when you're, you know, let's taste it, when you're having to talk to senior people both about their own remuneration rewards, but also how they work with other people, you get amazing insights as to both the strengths of people's characters and personalities and what the areas for, for development are as well. And so I would really sort of encourage um, HR folk. And I, and I think we'll see a day, um, you know, I was quite unusual at the time. Is I, you know, I actually joined Pearson working in investor relations and corporate affairs. And I was very lucky to work for a company that allowed me to then make a move into to general management. And I, I think, you know, HR folks should also be thinking is, um, you know, do I have aspirations to be the CEO? Do I have aspirations to run a business and, and be willing to go on and take P&L roles? Because I think that much more multi-dimensional and multifunctional view is becoming increasingly important. Mm, brilliant. Could you sh- share us some, some of the people and culture barriers along the way of the transformation that kind of surprised you? And, and if you were to go back, how would you do it differently? to successfully break through those barriers? Um, I think the point about, this point about making change seem as as, as small, specific and near term as you can is really, really important. I, I thought it was incredibly exciting, this big digital transformation and all these things and not realizing that, that well, yeah, it, if you're the CEO, maybe it is, but unless I understand what it means for me specifically and what it means for how I do for my job tomorrow, it actually just feels like everything that I've always held through, you've just thrown up in the air and I don't know what it means and how it's going to land. So having that empathy and understanding, listening, standing in the shoes of others, um, recognizing that things don't, you know, we made some organizational changes that didn't work and we reversed them. And I didn't see it as a sign of weakness to do that because we'd learned something. And so when you learn something, you make a change. Uh, When you introduce new systems and processes, they rarely work as they should and there are unintended consequences. Unless you really take the time to sit down and listen to people and 
um, shuffle around in their shoes for a little while and understand the world from their point of view, you, you're not going to do so. I think that, and, and this is actually digital transformation, the digital bit's the easy bit. The hard bit is the people bit. And people only change if people feel respected, if they feel listened to, and if they feel you've really understood and cared about them. And that means re listening and reflecting in back and, and sharing pain and empathy and, and all of that. I think this is that's the most important part of it. So if, if you were to put in perspective in terms of critical success factors, uh, strategy, technology, people and culture size, what percentage out of 100%, what percentage would you allocate those functions in order to ensure that the actual digital transformation is a successful initiative and doesn't 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 fail yeah well i mean i think the i think there is a you know there's the there's the 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 warren buffett quote that was something around you know if the um the, if the reputation of a good management team meets the reputation of a of a bad it's bad industry it's not the industry that loses its reputation so do you know what i mean so if you sometimes it doesn't matter how good you are or how hard you work or how much you care in that if you're in a business where just it's fundamentally going against you so 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 strategy is important in terms of choosing the right sectors to be you know that you're making good choices about where you compete and what you take what challenges you take on and what you don't but I do, you know, we would often talk in person about, you know, culture each strategy for breakfast. And I do think that a, a sort of good strategy brilliantly implemented is always going to be better than a brilliant strategy implemented in a mediocre way. And the implementation is all about people, culture, organization, style, ways of working. And it's a lot about listening and learning and understanding from each other. So it is a great opportunity, best to be in HR. It's a great opportunity for HR to support your organization if it's the right HR that is understanding the business, that is building those connections with stakeholders and just be there for the customers and the organizations. But John Fallon, thank you so much. It's been a half an hour, very quick ride, but it was so fascinating. I really, really enjoyed speaking with you. I enjoyed I it well. too. I enjoyed the rest thank of the event. So, thank you so much being here with us.